Okay, first question, can everyone hear me? Yes. Fantastic. All right, next question, quick show of hands. How many of you were here yesterday morning for Dr. Bell's keynote? Okay, fair number of you. Uh, and that the um, she gave a keynote uh, and that on the future. And you might think that they may, might overlap a little bit with about what I'm going to be doing here. Um, there are going to be some distinct differences. I mean, she and I are distinctly different. I'm not Australian. Um, and that the I don't work for Intel. I don't know a thing about how to get water out of frogs. <laughs> but beyond that. Her presentation was based on her research as an anthropologist and was focused on the sorts of things that are different about us as humans and that but also connect us and how that would play into the future. I'm going to be talking more about the things that I've learned both from having been in the industry for a little while uh, and that plus being out there in the trenches with you guys, being able to go in and you know, try to understand how all this new technology works and how we can apply the lessons of yesteryear to what we're going on through here today. So, with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about the future. Last year, according to multiple industry analysts, we've had 900 million smartphones sold. This is great. And, Given the fact that you know, some of them will have been upgrading from existing smartphones or will be people who will have you know, collected a number of these things, I think I've got about 50 of them myself, but beyond that, there's still going to be plenty of people in previous years who didn't happen to upgrade last year, and these surveys don't include all the tablets. And so it's fairly safe to say that at this point in time, we have a billion users of mobile devices using the major mobile operating systems. And that's all your fault. People aren't getting these things because they like beveled edges. They're getting these things because you went out and wrote a bunch of apps. And that's what's driving this adoption. They are finding interesting things that they can do with this stuff. And so that's great. And so it's your dedication hard work, and consumption of energy drinks that has made all of this possible. I hope you're happy. <laughs> and now you can say that when you were at Mobile World Congress, you got a round of applause. <laughs> but we're not done yet. World population's a little over seven billion. Now, many of them are never gonna wind up with any of these sorts of devices. Yeah, social economic reasons, just simple disinterest. Someday in the future, we will run out of people and we'll have to move on to new markets, dolphin-centric user interfaces and so forth. But I feel fairly confident that we are going to be able to get at least another billion humans using these devices, probably within the next few years. And it's easy to think that that next billion it's just like the first billion. I mean, they've got two arms and two legs in most cases and stuff like that. And so you may think that, okay, it's just a continuation of what's gone on before. But if there's one thing that you learn, it's that change is constant. Things differ. The people differ. The world in which those people live in differ. And as a result, we need to take that into account in the apps that we create, and the other stuff that we do as developers. A lot of that comes back to this innovation or technology adoption life cycle. Many of you will have seen this bar chart, or, sorry, bell curve before. We've got the innovators, the ones who are out on the bleeding edge of new technology. The early adopters were standing behind the innovators saying, hey, that edge is bleeding. But, oh, hey, that technology is kind of cool. We've got the early and the late majority where the bulk of our users come from. And then the others, labeled here as laggards, sometimes referred to by other terms, and occasionally involving some profanity. Now, we see that bell curve in lots of different places. 
Bear in mind that in mobile technology, that there's really lots of those curves. Different markets are going to be adopting things at different paces, simply if no other reason than when did the technology get introduced there. Technologies show up at different times based upon whether this is, you know, I mean, you know, political reasons, business reasons, carriers, you know, stomping their feet saying we don't want this stuff, whatever. And so the adoption rate, the shape of that curve and where we are on that curve is going to differ. Some places we are well into early majority, other places we are still back at the local innovators. And so the curves and how they all are overlapping and that's going to differ whether we're talking China, Canada, Czech Republic or Cameroon, Chile or Cuba. But it's fairly safe to say that the next billion is going to be heavily into the early majority, whereas that first billion is mostly coming from the innovators and the early adopters. And there are core differences in the ways that they think. Jeffrey Moore had numerous books out during the original internet revolution and that about crossing the chasm and so forth, talking about how the innovators and the early adopters set the stage, but then there is a transition as we move into the majority, and we have to take that transition into account, because that means that our users are going to be somewhat different. And a big piece of that is what's driving them to actually use any of this stuff. Why are they bothering with this technology? You know, in the case of the innovators, they go with this stuff for intrinsic motivations. Ooh, shiny. They love the new technology just because it's new, just because of what it represents, the potential. The early adopters also tend to be driven by intrinsic motivations. That They are seeing the potential. They maybe aren't the ones who are leaping in right away. They're letting the innovators, you know, deal with the pointy end of the spear, but they're the ones who are trying to figure out, okay, what can we do with this stuff? What can we take, do with these things to have fun, improve business, whatever? But as we start to drift into the early majority, our motivations for those users start to move more towards ex extrinsic sources. They're not necessarily opposed to the technology, the way that some further down that bell curve may be, but they're going to be more interested in or have more reasons that are driving them from outside themselves. You know, maybe their motivation is something more along the lines of peer pressure. You know, everybody else has got one of these things. About time I get one of them. It's going to be, oh, my kids are begging for one of these things. I should get one so that I have some understanding of what it is that they're getting into. What, you know, what sorts of trouble can they get into and cause and how am I going to be able to fix these things and stuff like that. And there's other motivations as well. We'll talk about another important one coming up a little bit later on. But it's these sorts of things are driving these people to use this technology, more so than, hey, they're just jumping into it for its own sake or its own potential. And the further we start moving down that curve, the more trouble we're going to run into in terms of what the in term seems to be today of mental plasticity or what we might refer to as adaptability. You all know people in that who struggle with PCs. They struggle with browsers. The, it's not that they're stupid. It's just that they don't think that way. They don't necessarily grok technology the same way everybody else does. Everybody's different. You all in here are probably in the innovators and early adopters areas and that the you know tech when you first got one of these devices, you were able to figure out how to use them relatively quickly by either just intuiting what's going on or being able to rapidly absorb what you're seeing from others. That's not necessarily going to be the case as we progress further and further into the human population. So if I asked you some technical challenge, you'd probably be able to come up with answers fairly quickly. On the other hand, if I asked you how good of a dancer you are, we're going to have a bell curve. 
Some of you have mad skills out on the floor. Others, not so much. And I'm firmly in that latter camp. At the same time, if I were in front of a room with a similar number of dance enthusiasts and asked them questions about, you know, how do you use one of these things? Put an iPhone in front of them and ask them how to set something up. We're going to have a bell curve. Some of them are going to have no problem with it, either because they intuit it or they can, you know, see other people use it. But just as you've seen people dance, that doesn't necessarily mean that you remember and doesn't furthermore mean that you necessarily remember and can translate that into human motion or whatever. It's the same thing just because people see tons of advertising about all these phones and tablets doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be able to intuit what's going on. Everybody's different. And that's going to mean that the learning curve for that next billion is going to be different than the learning curve of the first billion. We could assume some amount of self-discovery in terms of how this stuff works that we can't necessarily assume going forward. And a lot of that's going to come back to our user experience. How are we designing our apps to make sure that anybody, no matter their background, is going to be able to take advantage of them? Are they going to be able to figure out how to use our apps? You know, so long as you're focused on fairly basic gestures, it's relatively likely that people are going to be able to figure those out. You know, if you're doing taps and you're doing swipes in order to be able to move things around in your app, okay, that's, you know, reasonably discoverable. They're fairly simple. They're the sorts of things that will be fairly easy for someone observing somebody else in order to be able to replicate. You start moving a little bit further along and, okay, we're supposed to pinch this thing. Um, this doesn't seem to be doing anything. Um, and that they, they're going to have somewhat greater challenges. And the more complex, the more elaborate your particular gestures in that are going to be, the more likely it is that your users are going to be lost trying to figure out how to access that piece of functionality. Yeah, your power users know how to do this. But not everybody is going to understand that. And even if they were reading some blog post about this, that blog post was probably written by an innovator or early adopter. And so other people are saying, is this the, the fish pike? Is this the, the, the weapon pike? What, what position is... Ugh. And so you're going to need to think about how you map core gestures to the core features. How can you make sure that Everyone's going to be able to figure out what your app is about, how it's going to be used. Do the expected. Make sure that those early adopters can follow in the footsteps of the people who came before them without necessarily being able to intuit it all themselves. Follow the standards so that as they learn in one place, they can transfer that knowledge to others. This doesn't mean that you should Avoid all innovation, but you have to innovate carefully. Make sure it's innovation that is solving a problem and that the users are going to have some way of discovering how to use your innovation if they're not used to it from someplace else. So you need to think, how am I going to apply this sort of stuff? How am I going to make sure that those users who don't necessarily understand you know, what does pinch to zoom mean? How are we going to get that across to them? And a lot of that's going to come back to how you're providing them with assistance. They're not going to pick up the device and necessarily be able to figure out how to use your app just by looking at the pixels you're drawing. Of course, we're fond of expressions like RTFM. Now, some of you just know that by the acronym. You're, you're young and that the, you may not remember that back in the day, software used to come with manuals and that actual written instructions. Um, and that, that's, of course, fallen out of favor in, because we said the users weren't reading the manuals. The users said, well, the manuals are boring. I want to be able to figure out what's going on. What can you do? to help overcome this because there's no question that instruction is the way that these early adopters 
are going to be able to figure out the finer details of your app, but if they're not willing to read some manual or you're not even providing some manual, how are they going to figure that out? What can you do for just-in-time assistance? Can you pop up overlays and that on demand to show, okay, well, here are these different things. Here's, if you tap on this stuff, this is what's going to happen. Maybe on demand screencasts, side by side on tablets, unless maybe you're an iPad and you're maybe top to bottom, and that where you're going to be able to show your UI and show somebody walking through that UI at the same time. So that users are going to be able to see, ah, okay, well, if I activate these things, that's going to cause these effects, and that's how I get to this particular spot. What can you do in your apps to apply these sorts of things? What can you do to create the tools, the libraries, the frameworks to help other developers be able to do these sorts of things? And of course, there's other ways to get people to pay attention to this stuff is make it more interesting. I, you might think that I'm putting jokes in this presentation because I'm some sort of a goofball. No! Well, okay, maybe. But it's also, I know how this works. You've had lunch. Those seats are comfortable. It's siesta time. And so if I don't keep things entertained, you're going to start to... Uh, and that and that doesn't do either of us any good. Same thing with the manuals. How can you make them so that people want to do this? Can you make them a game? Apply some of the gamification stuff that we had from the unpanel yesterday. Make it an adventure, whatever. We got to think more about language as well. And of course, a lot of people focus on language from an internationalization standpoint because more people moving up those innovation, bell curves, adoptions, and that in more countries means more people for whom we're going to have to cater to their languages. But beyond that, there's also the issue of what it is that we're trying to tell them. You know, I mean, it, we used to using terms and assume that people are going to be able to remember at the first time they saw the term, intuit the definition and remember that, yeah, the further you get down that curve, the less likely that is to occur. So please try to speak like a human. You know what this hashtag means. You translated from hashtag to cat to English or whatever your native language is. The next billion users don't speak cat. They're going to, you're going to need to Reach to them more so than you have before. Now, if you take a look at what the people who have come before, the innovators and early adopters, what they've been using, it's going to have a common set of themes. These are based off of the Play Store, looking at top 10 apps in you know, various categories. We see a lot of games, streaming media, social networks, some utilities, a bit of messaging. What we don't see are a lot of what you would classically define as business apps. But that belies another key extrinsic motivator. And I really, really, really wanted to have the image here and that, but you know, all those pesky licensing terms. Um, you know, management is going to start to pay attention to those early adopters. The early adopters look at the technology and say, this is how I can accomplish something. This is how I can fix this problem. Sometimes that problem is how do I fix being bored in, you know, some line, some queue waiting for tickets. But in many cases, the problem is something related to work. And that next billion, a lot of them are going to be the guinea pigs. And that for as we are rolling out new apps aimed at business, there's going to be an increased interest in organizations having apps, not only shrink wrap stuff, but more importantly, bespoke, custom applications. 
80 to 90 percent of all software develop, I mean, software dollars spent historically has not been on shrink wrap software. It, they haven't been spending that on Microsoft Office. They haven't been spending it on Oracle. It's been creating apps by the organization for the organization, whether that be an enterprise, small business, nonprofit, government, whatever. But you look at the tech media and it's all, everything's App Store. The world is not the App Store. There's more to it than that. And a lot of that's not going to be visible if all you're doing is paying attention to App Store rankings and things like that. Some of this bespoke work is going to be in the large, big projects. Some of it's going to be a lot smaller. Sorts of things that, you know, somebody historically has slapped together some Excel spreadsheet because when all you have is Excel, all problems look like a spreadsheet. And therefore, they are trying to use those in order to automate something. What's the translation of those and that as we move into this mobile space? Who's going to write all this stuff? Yeah, I mean, you guys are writing it. You're smart, talented, and have great taste in conferences. But there's all the other people who are going to be needed, many of whom aren't doing this stuff yet, many of whom aren't necessarily even software developers. How are we going to help them be able to create the apps that are needed by their organizations? How are we going to be able to support them? Stack Overflow is a great resource. English is a single point of failure. How are we going to make sure that these next waves of developers are going to be able to get help while not necessarily being able to get that help in English? We think about programming languages a lot. And that leads into the whole cross-platform issue. You know, we're going to have increased pressure for trying to do stuff on many platforms. It's not, you know, just an iOS world. It's not just an Android world. And organizations for large projects, they may have the budget to do native work for all that, but the smaller the project, whether it be large organization, but just for a team, or smaller organizations, they don't have time. Cross-platform, whether it be HTML5, Cordova, PhoneGap, whatever, that says, you know, meaning never having to say you're sorry. Our app's going to work on all sorts of devices. But a lot of developers out there say that it's, you're always saying you're sorry. You know, some balding guy asked a question of the Unpanel yesterday about, hey, how does platform fidelity and that impact matters and that, and, you know, so a lot of blog posts out there say that, yeah, you know, that HTML5 stuff, I mean, you know, it, it, it's junk. It doesn't look very good. Bear in mind as we are moving forward that the priorities for custom bespoke application development is not the same as mass market. Enterprise applications have a long history of looking like crap. The fact that they look like crap on a small screen, as opposed to looking like crap on a larger screen, is just a question of the scope of the crap. And of course, security then is going to start to become that much more of an issue, not only for classic business reasons, but all that lovely stuff that we learned about over the past 10 months or so. What are we going to do to help defend our users' data, whether we're considering that to be the individual user or the organization who may be having the apps on the device? What can you be doing to accommodate that? And in some cases, we're literally defending more of the users themselves. Maybe your users are frogs living in fear of Australian anthropologists, things like that. <laughs> and so we need to not only make our app secure, we also need to think about how we are going to help all those waves of developers who are going to be working on all that bespoke development. How are they going to be able to make this stuff secure? while still making it convenient to the development so that it's secure out of the box as opposed to security having to be some sort of afterthought you bolt on. If nothing else, start here, pay close attention to your random number generators and remember that go-tos may be considered harmful. And of course, there's any number of other differences. 
There's all sorts of things that are going to vary. You need to figure out for your apps, your audience, how are they going to be changing as we move through the adoption life cycle, as we move through time. A famous Canadian, other than Carolyn, and that you know, likes to point out that you want to skate to where the puck is going. You want to aim for where your users will be at the point in time when you are shipping and your updates beyond that. Don't focus on the users of today. By the time you ship, those users will be different. The world will be different. In many respects, that first billion was the low-hanging fruit. The real work is now. How are we going to be able to address their needs in this next billion? And so you need to decide for yourself, how are you going to help that next billion? And with that, I think it's time for questions. Thank you. Let's grab this mic here. Thanks, Mark. That was really great. Didn't I tell you he was going to be great? <laughs> Who wasn't going to listen to me? So, who's got some questions for Mark? Somebody's got to help. Help me start with some questions. Yeah. Uh, right up here. Th this whole thing about these bespoke applications, does the world really need all that much bespoke applications? Or, or can we sort of transcend it into a world where there are more uh, general applications and less bespoke? Um, a, my gut reaction is that things aren't going to change there for no other reason than the organizations usually think that they are unique. Everybody's the magic flower. Um, and that. And so the, uh, everybody's special. And so they're going to want to do things their way. They want to have their invoices show up this way. They want to have their ERP system work this way. And that may or may not be able to be met by shrink wrap software. In some cases it can be, but then you wind up where that shrink wrap software has the macro language or whatever to basically allow programming inside of the app and all you're doing is just moving the, um, uh, you, know, you know, moving where the actual customization winds up being. Bespoke is not going away. So it'll be just as bad as the desktop? <laughs> um, well, it depends. I mean, the uh, one, one man's bad is another man's business market. So, uh, and that it's, a, and so, uh, uh, in some cases, bad is good. Ooh, More questions for Mark? Colors. Just tell me where you are, and I'll run around a little. Come on. I'm trying to think what I should ask you. Yeah, I've got one down here. Oh. Make me run, run. I think I've lost, a, honestly, I think I've lost 10 pounds this week. Hey, James. Thanks very much. Um, so I'm David from Relayer from Berlin. And I'm curious uh, what's, so if you think ad developers will get into also Internet of Things, and like how is this affecting the next billion also? Um, well, to some extent, the Internet of Things and that is going to be its own set of adoption curves and that we're still way in the innovator phase on, on the whole and that for Internet of Things. Um, and that the, uh, some of that's going to be driven and that, it, I mean, Internet of Things, we use that as an umbrella term, but there's a lot of things uh, in the Internet of Things. Some of that's going to be more business focused, some of that's going to be more consumer focused. Um, and that the, the business focus, those sorts of technologies tend to move more into early majority faster simply because if businesses are driving it, they're starting to push the technology more on people who on their own wouldn't necessarily be playing with it. Um, and that. So it's, you know, but it's not like just because we've got mobile and that where we are moved up that adoption life cycle that necessarily anything that smells a little like mobile was automatically promoted to that particular spot. A lot of that's going to have to move up that curve much the same way. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Actually, I, um, I've got a question too. So, Mark, you know, we we work a lot with with developers, mostly mobile developers. But what we're finding when we're getting into some of the verticals, so we're doing uh, whip gems like in the healthcare industry and some of the enterprise, and we're finding there's two kinds of developers that are coming out. 
There's the mobile developers that get mobile. And then there's the software, sort of the IT department developers that think they know everything, have no clue about mobile, and they want to, like, honestly, I've seen these people, they're rebuilding phone gap within their industry. It's like, it's, those tools are out there. How do we help those guys? Because we certainly, there's, there's enough work for everybody, right? Um, electric cattle prods? <laughs> <laughs> um, and that more seriously, and that the, to, to some extent, a, a lot of what, you, some of what you're describing isn't, isn't necessarily going to change just because, you know, not invented here isn't just a phrase, it's reality in many of these, these, these organizations, many of these industries. You know, they have, going back to the bespoke question, and that the, it's, a, it's a matter of trust. Uh, and that the, how do I trust that Adobe is going to steward PhoneGap, PhoneGap isn't going to wither on the vine, gee, I'm much better served by investing in creating this stuff ourselves, and that we can control when it dies. Um, and that the, but I mean, the, it's a lot of it's education, uh, and that making sure they understand the, the possibilities, what the options are, um, and in particular what the capabilities are, and that, you know, PhoneGap is a delightfully extensible platform, and that a lot of what they're rolling themselves could probably just be bolted into uh, PhoneGap more as on a plug-in basis. Sorry, I'm just trying to get my next unpanel to go behind and get mic'd up. <laughs> okay, so who's got some more questions for me? Anybody over here? How was the presentation? Woohoo! Questions? No? Oh, got one, one up here, and then Mark, maybe I'll, I'll uh, okay, I've got one last question for you. We'll let uh, this gentleman go again. All right, back to the bespoke uh, issue again. Um, we we got to make sure that that the platforms are you know they they're not locking in their customers because some of that suspicion is legitimate. So I think there's a job here to make sure that you know the software providers are honest and straightforward and to keep them accountable of a lot of stuff and we're the ones who have to do that. Oh, absolutely, uh, and that, and so the uh, ironically, that's the sort of thing where you know, going back to Carolyn's point, and that where they're reinventing PhoneGap, and that PhoneGap is open source, and that in principle, therefore, you know, the. E e Anybody is capable of keeping that alive if they have the interest to. They don't necessarily have to rebuild it from scratch. Um, the, but yes, I mean, certainly uh, proprietary technologies and that, yeah, I mean, it's no different than the way it's been in IT for decades and that, you know, if it's proprietary and that it's got its pluses and its minuses and one of those minuses is, you know, what happens if, you know, the firm behind it and that changes course, pivots uh, and that or dries up and blows away like a tumbleweed. Uh, uh, possibly with like sock puppets inside of the tumbleweed, um, and that and so you know I mean, it's uh, I mean the, the it, those things aren't changing uh, and that because that's less a question of technology and more a question of human nature and culture. Mobile phones can only do so much. <laughs> One last question. All right. Well, Mark. I am so glad you were here. Hey, and uh, hey, when I, I, one of the first spam I sent out, I said I picked three great keynotes. I handpicked them all because I knew they were going to be absolutely wonderful. So we had Genevieve Bell. Unfortunately, Tommy Palm couldn't make it, but I, if, if any of you saw Ruth yesterday from SwiftKey, I thought she was absolutely amazing. And I'm so glad that our last keynote is you, Mark, because I think you're absolutely amazing too. Well, thank I, you very thank much. You. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>